Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion of Ayn Rand's classic libertarian novel, At the Shrugged. There are spoilers in the discussion, so if you'd prefer not to hear those before you read it, you might want to read it first. So I hope you enjoy the discussion, and thank you so much for listening. Now, I found the book to be very much almost like a, a rite of passage for me to read. Yeah. It's like my entry um, into a philosophy of like the book that I'd heard about. You know, it's like the, the book, you know, you've got to read um, At the Shrugged. It's like Ayn Rand's magnum opus or something. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. One, you know. um, <laughs> I've I got to say, it, um, it exceeded my expectations. It yeah. exceeded the hype. Yeah. I was genuinely really blown away by it. It had yeah. quite a strong emotional reaction yeah. Yeah. as well as an intellectual reaction to it. And it really stimulated me. One of the things it did was kind of, <laughs> it made philosophy sexy and cool again for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> in a way. Like, um, not, not that it, you know, it never lost its cool and sex daggy, appeal, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I am puts, sexy, yeah, she puts a lot of sex in cool there. The <laughs> it made, like, you know, wow, yeah. It's not technical kick-ass as well, as well right? I mean, a lot of philosophy is so technical. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's not very just dry. dry. But, I mean, it's dry, but it's, it's also really I think there's a lovely there's a lovely thing about this book. I know what you mean. That one of the things about it is that it's so, you know, fuck you, capitalist. Mm. Yeah, that's something great about this book. It's really absolutely unapologetically pro free market and pro freedom issues. And it and in fact, it's like on the offensive in terms of reclaiming the moral high ground. Yeah, yeah. And that is just brilliant. You know, I mean. She was all on her own doing that. I don't yeah. know of anybody else. Obviously, there's a lot of, of books that around her time which were kind of like, well, if you think about it, the free market really is rather efficient, and wouldn't it be better if everybody just... But she's like, you know, you guys are evil. Yeah. yeah. And that is so powerful. I mean, that's yeah. like a really amazing um, and brave thing to do, um, especially in the 1950s when they were all... You know, basically, Europe was like major, massive communist parties in all, yeah. all European parliaments. Yeah. Mm. So, God, it must have been just an amazing kind of blast of fresh air in a way, having yeah. Iron Rand around. Absolutely. And I really appreciated that, and I really appreciated the way that she absolutely, because I, I, I'm. Some of the stuff about the characterization is really is a bit wooden, really. They're, they're, they're all so chiselled. Mm. But everything that they say, in terms of their moral arguments and everything, is all so right on that mm. it's, you know, it's just joy to read it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Especially, I think, at that time, after the war, there was, in, in Britain, I think, there was, a lot, apparently, it became quite socialist. There was lots of, like, I think that was where the welfare state kind of got bigger and and there was a lot of, yeah, yeah, a lot of those kind of social programmes and things. So to, to go against that, I suppose, at that time, would have been harder than today. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, because it would be completely against the sort of spirit of the age, so to speak. And yet, apparently, she was so successful that she managed to get a bestseller out of it. Right? Mm. Yeah. Even though it's a thousand... Pages long. I mean, <laughs> she's got a bestseller that's a thousand pages long. That's yeah. quite an achievement in itself. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what, what was the emotional reaction that you were talking about when you read it? Is it? it... Uh, I guess I went through a spectrum of, of emotions reading it, and <clears> different <throat> attachments, different characters, and, and stuff. Um, partly because the book surprised me in terms of how deep it was um, exploring psychological motivations on the characters, especially things like um, Hank Ridden's family mm-hmm. right. with yeah. his mother. That was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was really... Mm. The family dynamic was explored, and I didn't expect that. So. Mm. Yeah. Um, but also, um, I had a really... Well, partly because of what I was going through at the time, and I think it was worked out really well that I read Out of Shrug when I was feeling very proud of accomplishments that I made in my life. And the feeling of pride that I had after reading that book was really intensified. Yeah. I right. came out yeah. of that, of, of reading out of shrug, thinking, wow, now I really understand what pride, pride means. Like, pride in your work, like having a work ethic and, and being productive and being creative, but really taking joy and pleasure in work and being 
like like you said, it's a book. It's unabashedly, unashamedly pro-capitalism, pro-free market. It's just like get out of my way. Yeah, you know what says, right? It's just, yeah. you know, here I come, and, and that was like, wow, you know what? Yeah, I can take pride in who I am, and I can take pride in um, the principles that I live, and and this this book really kind of like supercharged that for me. Like, yeah, wow. and you know, it's, it's good that she was doing that in a time that um, she wrote it. Like I said, it's, it was even more incredible. Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about it is the joy that, say, Hank Reardon takes in his work, and it's like he's annoyed that he has to go to a party or something because he just wants yeah. to get on with what he's doing. <laughs> like yeah, right. To some party, yeah. where most people can see work as like annoying and yeah, absolutely. And, and, but he, to him, that is his joy. It's, it's mm. like doing what he's doing. She yeah. describes what a party should be like in reality as well. The idea that it should be about people meeting up once in a while and celebrating themselves and their achievements and that sort of thing. And yeah, I totally get that. That like a lot of socialising is just people, well, yeah, slapping themselves on the back for very little accomplishment and kind of. And also, and all of the little games that are going on around Reardon yeah. that he's just not interested in. Yeah, you know, his wife doing all the social manoeuvring yes. and and um, and uh, tag at um, what's his name? The Jim, brother, Jim Tam. Yeah, doing all of his you know politicking and yeah. stuff. Yeah. What about you guys? Did you did you have a quite a strong emotional reaction to the book? I did. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally get what you're saying. I, I read it um, when I first started commuting to my first proper, like, decently well paid job, and uh, I read it on the train as well, which is kind of apt. And um, <laughs> yeah, and it, it to- I totally get that it's a sense of pride and being and not feeling guilty about that. You know, feeling mm. yeah, just just that it's the natural it's the natural state is to to be. Sort of proud of your um, accomplishments, and pride is kind of frowned on by sort of mainstream s- schools of thought, or like religion and stuff like that. Yeah, it's if so you're proud, you're you're arrogant. It's so sin, you know, that, you yeah. need to be. Yeah. Um, that's what they do with celebrities. They they, mm-hmm. they pin them up so they can pull them back down again. We have that, like, especially in I think Europe and in Britain, we have a really, really cynical kind of cultural, yeah, um, yeah, you know, atmosphere or whatever. And uh, that that in in the book because it's just so. Paper capitalism and yeah. stuff that mm-hmm. make me really um, be, feel okay with that, and uh, yeah. even though the, a lot of it's um, very um, icon- iconic, I suppose, yeah. and very kind of glossy, and yeah. like the characters are uh, bigger than life, and yeah. you know, um, it's Which, yeah. I don't know, it fits because they are kind of like what she's pointing out with that as these are really the superheroes yeah. of society, in many sense. they are the, yeah. the foundation of society, they are the, the guys that. That create things using their mind and and, yeah. and and mold things into matter, you know, yeah. that actually advance human civilization. Whereas the the moochers, yeah. the leeches, they're the ones who pill- yeah. just pillage yeah. that. Yeah. And um, that made me like I really, I really got that on some yeah, yeah, yeah. fundamental yeah. level. Absolutely, like I was part yeah. of something which is really huge and as yeah. a historical battle going back, not just. Um, through Europe for hundreds of years or something, but through the millennia, there's, yeah. always, there's always been that battle between the parasites and the, the productive classes. And that was like, wow. That, something about that. This, there is a, a war, there is a battle out there for like, between good and evil. That, yeah. is, that is real. And you, you get that with uh, Ayn Rand's sense of um, ideas about ethics and morality as well. That's very, very strongly interwoven with the characters. Yeah. I, I actually really, really like that, even though it was the characters are kind of almost cliches of themselves, but it, it works. I think it's really good because she's trying yeah. to make very strong statements with the characters. Yeah. And also the, the, I guess the way people twist words and twist philosophies to make that seem, to make the, the mooching seem like the right thing to do. Yeah. Their the moral justification is being, yeah, the productive people being basically immoral, which is insane. And she paints that picture of like, this is, this is the world. And then this is the kind of, uh, the, what do you call them? The morality, the false morality. Um, um, method, I can't remember what she calls it. No, there's a, there's a second hand. Uh, um, no, the, the, the metaphysicians. The, yeah, it's it's something along the lines of yeah metaphysics. I can't remember, but yeah, she 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 paints that strand of kind of um, those two competing. The, this is the facts of the world, and then this is the kind of bullshit that people weave over the top of it to make it look exactly the reverse. Yeah, like there's that thing um, where they try to reduce this competition law or something. Yeah. That, you know, just mm. a bit like red. Yeah. And, um, and they dress it up as kind of like... Fair healthy. share or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's basically just destroying like you know, free trade essentially. You know, like they're saying that 
only one person can run a particular so railroad. Yeah, the or something. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And the thing is that it is amazingly prescient. All yeah. of these types of terms, you know, are totally used to justify these types of rules. Yeah. Mm. And it it does feel I can understand why it's having a resurgence now because it does feel like. Because that is actually the world that we live in. Absolutely. It's not yeah. that explicit, yeah. but it's actually the world that we live in. Yeah. yeah. That's part of the excitement I was reading it. was, oh, this is, this is really starting to happen now. You can, yeah. The, the, the crumbling walls of, of um, a state of society are now starting to, you know, you, you can really yeah. see the ruins now of, of, as it goes down. Um, it's, and so it's, it's quite exciting in that respect. Because it, it, it gives you quite a hopeful um, ending in, in the book as well. One of the things that I think comes out really well um, just talking about that sort of moral sense that she has is the idea of the sanction of the victim, mm-hmm. and like, and I think that's it's one of those ideas that actually hearing it in the conversations in the book really helped me because I know that idea, and Steph talks about it as well. Mm. But actually seeing like how Hank Reardon comes to understand that, and uh, and. Well, all of the characters, like Dagny as well, how they come to understand that they don't want to give their sanction. Because it could just be a, a, a simple book where, you know, basically you've got the productive guys and they're pissed off because everyone else is, you know, giving them hassle. But actually, they make the moral case, like, I will not agree with your, ha- mm. with, you know, with your moral condemnation of me because I'm not sanctioning your... Uh, moral case against me because you're right. wrong, basically. And, and I'm actually in the moral in the right here yeah. Yeah. and that you really see that come through in the conversations mm. like sometimes in the book the conversations there are some bits of it where the novel form doesn't really work so well for what she's trying to do because yeah. she has these speeches <laughs> like, yeah. i remember there's this speech that um i think francisco gives at the party about sex and your choice of sexual partner right and it goes on for like 20 minutes. Yeah. And, <laughs> like, and, and, yeah. and I'm just imagining in my mind's eye, he's talking at this party. Yeah. And in my mind's eye, there are these people like looking at their watches. Yeah. And somebody like got an empty glass, like, still <laughs> listening 20 yeah. minutes later. And this guy is holding forth, giving this speech. You know? But when you see, but, so some things you can tell, this is a vehicle for an Iron Rand speech. Mm-hmm. But there are other things where you, you actually follow them in their evolving understanding of those ideas that the novel works really well for. Yeah. Yeah, she almost gives you sometimes like a philosophy timeout. It's like, timeout! There's <laughs> <laughs> a huge chunk of philosophy, and yeah. you're just like back to the, yeah. the story, and you're like, oh, relax, yeah. and you, kind of, you, yeah. you get to see what they're up to. Um, I just want to find out one thing. When you guys are talking about the, the trains, I just realised like what a brilliant choice that was, because... I used to think what there is a kind of a, an obsession that she has in the book with talking about um, really key things in, in the economy, which I can understand because there there are at any one time different economies really core yeah. uh, things like the the energy industry yeah. and the transport industry and stuff. But um, um, what you pointed out, Kevin, was um, that like when, when you listen to it, you can be listening to it on the, on the train. Yeah. And if someone's going to be um, really getting Ayn Rand's ideas and they're kind of like commuting to work every day, yeah. like I just remember that, like listening to it like on the way to work, on the way back from work. Yeah. Like the trains are a huge part of my life. And when yeah. there's like train delays and yeah. stuff like that, you really notice it. And uh, I remember like uh, when there was like massive delays and union strikes and stuff, the first place I noticed it was in the trains. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting that she actually chose that. I thought at first it was like oh, a weird obsession with the trains, but you, it's yeah. something I really notice in my everyday yeah. life. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a lot of scenes around the, the, the uh, trains, like when uh, Reardon first lays the new steel, mm. and they're, they're running the train over it for the first time, yeah. and like, how they take such pride in their accomplishments. And, and Dagny's kind of, you know, she's sort of at the front with Reardon, and yes. they're both kind of like in, in awe of this like huge locomotive, yeah. like absolutely blistering speeds going down the tracks. Yeah. I thought that was a really, really powerful scene. Yeah. Apparently, Ayn Rand learned to operate a train and uh, like spent a lot of time. Really? Yeah. In research for the yeah, book? Yeah, in research for it. Yeah. I also wondered whether or not, because she started, I think this book t- took like 10 years or something for That's her to right. write. Yeah, absolutely. And she, absolutely. so she would have started it in the 1940s mm. when the trains were still like the things that really connected the country up. Mm. But then, of course, they started building highways. Yeah. And by the time she'd finished writing the book, they probably were already 
the trains were a lot less relevant because people were just going down the interstate highways. Right. Which was like in the post-war period, like the car had really started to take over long distance. Mm. So I think, but obviously then it's also linked in with the plot, with, with the steel and everything else. Mm. It's a strange kind of like, not exactly science fiction because everything's s- semi if, of her time, but you also have like reared and metal and yeah. you know what I mean? It's yeah. like a sort of, Almost science fiction book, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, a little bit. They talk about the people's state of Norway, the people's state yes. of Norway. Yeah. So it's like a dystopia type thing. Yeah. Right. It's like she put it, she's almost suggesting this is this is just around the corner. It's like it's not. And it's believable as well because a lot of dystopian fiction that you read, it's like you think, well, it's never going to be at that point. But this, you know, like even mm. though she talks in one bit about, you know, having to send care packages to the people's state of France, like, they're in desperate need of food. And yeah. it's, it's like a third world country, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. It's not that unbelievable. No, actually. not at all. And it's funny how just literally putting the people's state of in front of a country makes it believable yeah. that it would be, like, a really The democratic in. republic of. Yeah. yeah. Like, whatever yeah, whatever exactly. country, yeah. I, mean, as soon as, I think as soon as those terms start to be used, it's just kind of propaganda, isn't it? That yeah. people... This, the people, I know it's always going about the people, you know, we should give mm. power to the people. But it's like, you know, just, in his eyes, the people are, he means give more power to the government. Obviously. Yeah, he's it's talking like, about very selective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I also found her predictions about the state meddling in science absolutely fascinating. Mm. Oh, yeah. The state science institute, because I don't know you guys, like, um, I, well, I know, I'm sure you all love science, but I was keeping up with the latest like, scientific discoveries yeah. and stuff, and, and checking out the latest, you know, science, popular science um, mm. news and stuff. Um, but you, you, when you see like uh, the, everything from like the climate gate scandals to like these these multi billion hadron colliders and stuff, which is it's all comes from kind of state funding, and you see how how much pressure a lot of scientists are under, and how much political funding and money there is, and all this kind of like, I mean, I think the one thing that um, almost like she missed out on, which has come true in our time, but it's not that the shrugged, is probably the only thing I think of is like the whole global warming thing yeah, just being a massive thing. issue. Yeah. She didn't see mm. the whole environmentalist movement. Yeah. Coming, although there, there are actually some kind of hints at that. I think there's like a, a character, one of the wives of one of the um, politicians, and she's always all about wheatgrass and Buddhist uh, yeah. veganism or something, and there's little references to, to stuff like that because it's better for the environment or something. Yeah. But, um, but like, that's a huge issue of our time, and that's all to do with, um, you know, state influence over yeah. you know, science funding and stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess, the, yeah, because the interesting thing is that basically reactionary ideas in her time were just, like, blatantly socialist, whereas now that's been so so disproved by fact so many times hmm. that they've gone into something else which is you know environmentalism hmm. which is a way of being kind of anti free market basically anti industry hmm. because hmm. the idea is like oh if you let people if you leave people to their own devices they'll go and pollute the atmosphere and kill yeah. the earth and yeah. you know all the fishes will die and, and so on and so yeah. forth yeah yeah yeah, I think if I ran around today, she'd definitely like she'd peg the environmentalist movement yeah. as a as a commie yeah, or right, socialist. Right. Oh, movement. she'd be totally. Yeah. And I, I'd say I would agree with her. I know it's yeah. a very general statement. Yeah. It's strange because really, I think the, the the best way to protect the environment would be to to, to have everything you know to use the word privatise it. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. that way, the people who owned it would look not after want it. To, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you Including know, the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rivers and everything. They wouldn't if if it, you know if if. A, a corporation of shareholders owned a river, they wouldn't just allow it to be polluted. Yeah. yeah. Whereas when it's just a politician making a decision, they've got no real stake in it, they're going to yeah. be out of office in a few years. Then they, 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 it's, I think that's the situation where they're much more likely to think short term and they're, and they're you know, probably corrupt as well and they, mm. they'll allow the river to be polluted because they, you know, they've got no stake in its ownership. They just, Absolutely. It's a, it's a brilliant issue for politics and to... to to get basically to get more government because nature is huge right and the the environment that planet earth etc is so big and it it seems overwhelming to the individual how the hell are we going to look after this we need something equally big and powerful yes, which yes. is the government and, right mm. but once you start as you say like dividing it up 
it's actually not. It's actually this chunk of river that needs looking after. It's this chunk of ocean which needs to not be overfished. It's mm. you know. What, well, what's so fascinating, I find, is is that this is um, sort of a new landmark in the cooperation between governments and universities and funding of science, which is now just so um, overwhelmingly statist. Um, especially because, you know, for economic reasons at the moment, everything's being squeezed and, like, research and development and stuff by the companies is going to be smaller. And, and yet you're seeing, like, huge chunks of money going all mm. over the place for these, you know, yeah. crazy um, state-funded science experiments. Mm. And, it's, uh, and I just think, like, that prediction was absolutely brilliant. And it becomes really central to the plot in the end, you know, how um, even some of the guys connected to the State Science Institute are building, you know, these insane weapons of, of mass yeah, destruction, that was basically. About the misuse of science. Becomes but... militarised, yeah. and it's, and it, and oh, it's all so supported good. by the heads of the... I think it's one of the universities, or it's actually connected with the State Science Institute in some way. Well, you it's know, one of the guys below him, I think. And... Right. You know, apparently, I was reading on Wikipedia that she, she modelled um, the main scientist guy, not the political one, but the actual... You know, the, the, the guys, there were two teachers. Stadler? Sorry? Stadler, is that what you're talking about? No, he's Stadler. the philosopher. Is, oh, Stadler, yeah. Yeah, Stadler. Yeah, yeah. yeah apparently she modelled him on Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, yeah, that's what he And that is an interesting one, because she, apparently she met him. Yeah. She met yeah. Oppenheimer. And he's a great example of, I mean, the guy developed nuclear weapons. There could be no yeah. more anti-human weapon in the world, like, because... You cannot use a nuclear weapon to specifically, you know, retaliate yeah. in self-defense against something. You just, it's, it, it just wipes out everything. So Completely indiscriminate. Yeah. yeah, indiscriminate, which is a totally statist kind of weapon. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it was interesting that she, she modeled him on, on, on a real guy. That's really interesting. On Oppenheimer. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, in her time, she would have been writing this just after the first nuclear bomb had been... Let off. Yeah. And, yeah. and how fucking bizarre is that? They they actually used it. Mm. Yeah, they just took yeah. out like three cities. Well. Yeah. 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 Or two cities, rather. Yeah, that's just, yeah, mind blowing. Now, it's it's just completely mind blowing. I, I guess mean, the roots of every weapon are somewhere in, 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 in kind of scientifically minded people, engineers. Absolutely, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The military industrial complex. The one thing I thought was a bit sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm only halfway through, so I'm not sure, like, whether or not she has a different take on it. Like, I did appreciate that um, in some of the um, uh, characters, like Jim Tag uh, Taggart, you do see the corruption of corporations, right? You really see them mm. using the state. But... She's also got, I think, quite a romantic view of big business per se, in that she mm -hmm. imagines it to be run by these pioneering, pioneering individuals. individuals. Yeah. And like, I think the corporations, once they get that big, are so part and parcel of this whole status mm. system that, I mean, those, what I'm saying is those pioneering guys do exist. But I don't think big business is necessarily where you find them. So right. by the time you get up to that level, you're already so ingrained in all of the, you know... I mean, she does have... Reardon has lobbyists, which is interesting. Yeah. His lobbyist yeah. is just a bit rubbish. Yeah. And, and he's, kind of, he's not even sure what they're for in the book. Yeah, which is, yeah. That, that's bollocks. Wouldn't be that naive yeah, they would, yeah. There's no way you would say, oh, I, I have some lobbyist in Washington. I don't know what he does. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. You know, you're already, you're already totally part of that um, corrupt system. Yeah. Mm. I think it's because because when uh, maybe it's the bigger businesses that are more in alliance with the state. I mean, that's the, you know with, with the lobbying and everything. So it's kind of, um, I mean, that's the definition of fascism, isn't it? Corporatism yeah. is the absolutely. Kind of, mm. Corp big corporation using the state, the power of the state to, uh, you know, advance their own interests, really, probably at the expense of the small businesses. I was thinking about how, at, uh, I thought that when she showed someone like Jim Taggart and contrasted that with, uh, you know, say, Dagny, right, um, 
she really did a great job of showing how it stops be, being about value for value, but rather bribes for favors when you start to get involved in the state and you're trading kind of like you're just trading people's reputations like, but it, it's just this whole mess of, um, of broads and I'll do this for you if you give me this regulation, if you do this sanction, you know what I mean? Like, and it's just this endless um, mess. Whereas, you know, uh, obviously I would agree with you that, that she does that sort of a romantic view of people like Reardon and Dagny still being around once they get that big. Uh, and still being in control once they get that big, but still, um, I like the contrast because absolutely, you know, it's actually so much simpler when it's just value for value, you know. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And you've got to grant her a certain amount of artistic license to really explain the idea as well. And and I do think that you you I agree with you that I I thought she describes that mess of um, trading, you know, bribes for favors beautifully well but she also shows how it just collapses in on itself because after a while everyone's bribed everyone to give contradictory favors so you know you do, like it, the the even the people who are effectively using the system get kind of gobbled up by the system because mm -hmm. at the end of the day like even uh, Taggart doesn't get what he wants anymore because he, he can't bribe like I can't remember the exact specifics, but he can't bribe various people because they've already been bribed by other people yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know? and what's so fascinating is they're constantly in fear of having their own hypocrisy ex exposed. Mm. Yeah, and and there's this, and yet like they they said they talk about their friends, but their friends are really just the people that they're kind of doing favors for, and yeah. like I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing, yeah. and that could like change at any moment depending on the political power and they're yeah. all trying to buy against each other in secret even yeah. though they're, they're kind of each other's friends yeah. really there's, there's no real bond or, yeah. or ethics there it's, it's just purely manipulation for, for their own you know, greed and corruption and yet there's that mutual um, unspoken understanding that you don't talk about the corruption that's going on yes. you talk around it yeah. And, yeah. and she I, I, that's probably my favourite part of the book is the the way that um propaganda emerges like it doesn't it's not like planned out in any way you know um like all george orwell talks about you know double speak and all this kind of stuff yeah. but i think ayn rand even tops orwell in terms of showing how um, language is manipulated and, and, and abuse and, and uh, morality inverted and how it happens in such a subtle insidious and surreptitious manner mm. it's, it's not like overt it's kind yeah. of hinted at and then someone else kind of gets it through yes. the winks and the nods and then it just becomes this this pact and how even within the state everyone's at each other's throats and yeah. yet there's this veil of civility yeah and that that was just pure genius for me yeah like, that was mm. writing genius so I, yeah. I found that fascinating like jim taggart he's my one of my favorite characters because i hated his guts like i hated that guy yeah. so much um, because he's just so disgustingly corrupt and constantly running away from his own shadow, yeah. mm. and he's he's just being destroyed by his own conscience. Yeah, and and constantly digging himself into a deeper and deeper hole until at the end he's just you know um, become an absolute um, vile, you know, Monster. slug of a man. Yeah, yeah. and um, I just found that that, that fascinating. Um, whereas the the other characters they had their own struggles, but mostly it was um, their struggle against. Um, others attempt to corrupt them, yeah. And it was realizing that actually what I'm doing is is good, and everyone else is telling me that it's, that it's, that it's bad, and I should feel guilty for it. But actually, now I feel pride in my work, and then I kind of cut right through all the, the bullshit. And yeah. That there was that, like, uh, like you said, there there was definitely a, a a huge difference, which doesn't actually occur in reality, between the, the capitalists and the creative and productive classes, and the, the corruption of, of the political system and yeah. so on. It, it's much more of a grey area than that, but. Yeah. The way she did that it was very clever to show the difference of people who have intrinsic value and trade value for value and have some kind of objective ethics against the people that are just kind of very much in the womb at the moment and just after whatever they can they can get. Mm. And um, uh, it's what you're saying there. Um, 
I specifically remember her talking about Wesley Mouch and where Wesley Mouch came from, like that, that one part of the book where it explains Wesley Mouch's history. And it's just so underwhelming and, like, you know, she's just so incredibly, like, mediocre in every way that it points out, it, it, it helps me understand emotionally that violence had to be involved for this guy to have gotten to such a, like, you know, quote, high level of power because, he doesn't have anything to offer particularly. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it, like, on the free market. So it's kind of just like, well, there's got to be, like, you know, tax dollars involved somewhere. Because the sort of the whole trading bribes for favors and all of that stuff that we've been talking about, it's like the only way that that can even happen is if there's stolen money to begin with. Because there's no other way to get money through that methodology, like through bribes and favors, than if it was stolen to begin with, you know? And because uh, it's no no one feels any attachment to the money really because it's not something they earn so it's just kind of more of like a just grab what you can kind of thing mm-hmm. and uh, I thought that was particularly well portrayed in the fact that all of the characters that were sort of the looters were their personalities were sort of um, I guess very underwhelming and sort of mediocre <laughs> I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, yeah like, I found what you're saying really, really interesting because um, what I give uh, Rand uh, massive credit for is that even though she's pro capitalism, pro free market, and pro you know sound money, and and it's very much um, you know, talking about business productivity, and and Reardon is obviously a very wealthy guy, and Dagny's doing pretty well for herself, and yet they're not kind of greedy money grabbers. Precisely because of this ethics, they understand what goes into like they they value every dollar. Um, because of the work that goes into it, you know, if it's honestly earned. And what's, I love that scene where, um, what is it, they're at a party and Dagny swaps her, her necklace, is yeah, it? For yeah, for um, Ridden's, the Ridden, Ridden's wife's um, Ridden's bracelet, bracelet. Of, yeah. of the new Ridden metal. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. wa- to Ridden's wife, it's worthless, and yet yeah. to Dagny, it's priceless. Yeah. And that was just like, wow, yeah. that really yeah. moved me, that scene. Yeah. And because uh, uh, and Jim Tagger and Mooch and those guys, they, um, they you know, they, they're spending money left, right, and centre. They have all these plush apartments and and uh, you know, parties and mm, and yeah. champagne and stuff. And yet they're constantly talking about you know getting giving to the poor and the social good and stuff. Mm. And yet the, the guys that actually their only money. fulfilment is in consumption, which shows in the way that they act. And whereas right, the right. other guys have yeah, fulfillment yeah. in production, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah being productive. Yeah, there's quite a few people in the, in the in our world now that are like that. I think like someone like Warren Buffett. I think from what I understand of it, he lives very modestly. Yeah, in a little house, same old car he's had. I think he has his private jet. That's the one thing. He, which he calls the indefensible, but the only reason is because it makes no sense for him not to have it when he's going to go around. Yeah, you know. and meet people. But really, he may control billions of dollars worth of wealth, but he doesn't consume very much. No. I think it's the difference between people assume that because someone's rich, they must be consuming vast <laughs> amounts of wealth. Really, they, no. it's, it's, it, I think it, to have wealth in the hands of these people is, is much better than in the hands of a government bureaucrat or something. Yeah, so it's really, I think it's great they're controlling a lot of wealth, and they and they don't tend to consume it, really. I think Buffett's part of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates thing as well, where they just give away inordinate amounts of money to charities. Yeah. yeah. Phil, I was just going to say, I appreciated your point about Mooch as well, because what I thought was interesting about this book was that he was such a, a nobody and such a completely mediocre guy and that is what bureaucrats are like, because in when she did the Fountainhead, there was this guy. I don't, I can't remember his name, but there was a kind of evil genius mm. in the Fountainhead who was like the intellectual who was behind everything and was kind of like. He was one of the architecture critics. The yeah, paper, the architecture it? critic yeah, guy, and and he was sort of like this evil genius, um, yeah. kind of making the whole system fall apart. Make or, or break anyone. Yeah, anymore, and. So. And what what she showed in this one is that the guy at the top of the of the um, of the state kind of controlled thing is not an evil genius. He's just a useless nobody. But he's yeah. been around in the right places at the right times mm. to get in that position. And I thought that was really that was really a, a, a very enlightening way of showing it because they are basically, you know, I mean, they're they're not 
geniuses. Uh, the guys who are running the state and who are in, in those control boards um, are, I, I think, really not clever guys. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean if, if things left to the free market, it's, it's got a sort of beauty in itself because the, the, the people who are the best at managing money and, and investing money and using it well are going to be the people who control the most money. Absolutely. Whereas in politics, it's kind of the people who are best at, you know... Stealing. Yeah. So... It's the violence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think he ruled with, with fear, basically, the, the guy in... Um, the guy, the head of the state guy, because it all... I mean, you, you didn't really get to meet him much in the book, I don't think, but you, all his kind of underlings lived in constant fear of... Mm. And tried to curry favours with him. I thought it was... To him. I thought it was also brilliant, the way that you slowly... As the novel progresses, and it's this is one of the things that she could do because it's such a long book, but she could have things like really progress, yeah. like iteratively. But as the novel progresses, you start hearing more and more people saying, well, I'll report you to the control board. And you start yeah. like the slave right. on slave violence. You know, you, you start hearing that in conversations and it starts to become more and more about people, you know, positioning themselves within a bureaucracy. And I guess, I mean, she must have known about this because she grew up within the Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. she would have experienced people doing the whole, I'll report you to, mm -hmm. you know, to the yeah. board and all that stuff when mm -hmm. she was a kid. And presumably, because she had family there, she must have had quite an inside view as to what was going on in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Maybe that's part of what's kind of... Um, yeah, she can probably see it more than the average, say, American, because she's seen the kind of more extreme version of it. So when she sees it kind of happening a little bit in America, she's, you know, whereas a normal American wouldn't kind of have had that, you know, that environment. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't see the danger as much as she would. Mm. Oh yeah, I think that that's uh, something about Iran that I always really liked is that the enemy perfect like she totally understood the end you know what i mean like there was no like like you always know you're you're a good um like like it's somebody who's on a debate team they're always the best at debating when they absolutely know the other side you know what i mean and um i always got that from Ayn Rand. it was always like wow she really gets why collectivism is just not the answer and honestly like i took i took that um to heart much more when I first read the book, I've read it three times now, but like when I first read it, I took that to heart much more than her, her sort of stance on capitalism and how that was great and all. You know, I, I was more like, I get why collectivism is wrong. It's more what I took from it. I, obviously, I got what you were saying about capitalism, but that's what really stuck out for me. I actually, um, I'm sorry, just to talk a bit. Um, I, I think I, I even underplayed the emotional reaction um, to, to the book that I had because... Um, uh, it almost seems like a quite profound thing for me to, to talk about, but w when I read Out of Shrugs, I really, for the first time, felt this, uh, like um, pride, I think, for the first time. And I, actually, right. I had like just tears welling up towards the end of the book, right. certain bits, and I, and I so just took the time out and I was like, wow, wow. I'm really, I feel really proud. And I, I'd, I'd never, um, I don't think I'd ever realised what it meant to be, Proud. And it wasn't just like, oh, I'm proud because I'm reading this book. It's like, it really had has a profound sense and deep understanding of what that means. And what I was going through in, in my life, it really helped me to connect with that emotion, with that other stuff that I was mm. proud of, about like, who, who I'd become and about my own my, you know, sense of ethics and mm. right and wrong and kind of stuff. Mm. And so it was, it was actually a really, really intense feeling. And it was just like, I actually had tears of, of, of joy, which was was really bizarre right. experience that's really, fantastic really yeah that's, that's amazing right. I'm, I'm really glad and yeah I think so I, ju I just want to point out that I, I don't think when you related it earlier you didn't mention you had tears welling up in your eyes but I think you did emphasize yeah you, it you much. could tell but you, then how. but when I right. uh, like when I mentioned it earlier I think I underplayed I didn't really um, I didn't restate the extent to which you felt that emotion, if that makes sense. What? You mean that I think, you I don't think you it? underplayed it. I don't think that I really related that back to you in the same way. I didn't mirror that. What do you mean when you just put it up just now? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the first thought that I have, that you saying I, I didn't really express it as well as I, I could have. I think that you, I, I thought that you did, but I just didn't really mirror it. Right, no, I appreciate you saying that. I think that I was glad that you brought it up again, because I, I guess I kind of wanted to reiterate that actually that was, reading this book really was really powerful, really powerful really in powerful, so many ways, yeah. just because it's a brilliant book, but also the, the time I, that I read it in my life, I think, mm. when mm. I read it again in the future, it won't be quite replicated in the same way, perhaps, but I'll always remember that, and that, that's why this book has had a particularly significant impact. That's mm. awesome. Mm. And I can understand it, too, because the book is, there's a lot about this book, which is that, um, which is about self-esteem and about, mm -hmm. like, taking mm -hmm. pride in things that people in our society actually try and make you feel guilty for. Yeah. And she's saying, basically, I refuse to accept your guilt and I actually relish who I am and I've got self-esteem mm -hmm. about it. And it's great because it is hard to have, um, it is like when, like the, this is the really disgusting thing about statism is that it permeates everyone to such an extent that the moral, you know, condemnation of, oh, you know, if you actually go and try and make a go of your own life and actually do your own thing. And if you do, rightfully, you know, resent having the fruits of your own labor taken by force away from you, mm -hmm. you get this moral condemnation that you should feel bad about that, right. when actually that's exactly, I mean, yeah. that's totally rational, you know? It's right. like, uh, it, it, I'm not explaining it very well, but what I'm trying to say is that statism basically undermines self-esteem if you are yeah. a productive person. Yeah, it's not like they just take away the fruits of your labor. But they, they they're actually trying to make you feel, make you feel bad for it as right, well. Exactly. They try yeah. to completely yeah. invert it. And like, mm. that's what corruption does. It, it just yeah. it not only takes the joy, but it, it like tries to, to punish and cripple you in the moment's yeah. yeah. And I think to not have I think, you know, emotionally dragging a lot of like historical baggage and then reading that book and then seeing like how proud Ayn Rand was in in, in and, uh, you know, her ethics and her and, and in capitalism, she really like reclaimed that word, like you said. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that's, that's incredible. That's a really, really powerful event. But, mm. but um, I actually yeah. wanted to ask you guys. Um, I was a bit worried because um, maybe some of you haven't finished reading the book, and obviously there's some interesting plot twists. <laughs> <in the time. laughs> so, how comfortable are you with me exploring the side of the book? That's Go, the end? Uh, I, I don't yeah, mind. I, I mean, I've kind of, I think I've kind of heard most of the uh, most of the plot. Uh, I get the basic idea, so I don't think it's going to be really taking that much away. Go for it. Right, well, when the zombies come in at the end... <laughs> <laughs> when they wake up and it was all a dream. Then... Um, or the dog you... wakes up and it's all a dream. And in terms of, like, looking at it from um, Ayn Rand's unconscious or Mika system and her psychology, what, what do you think um, the different characters and um, themes in the book represent? And especially, what do you think was going on with uh, Gulch Gulch in that regard? Like, what, what do you think... That, that I haven't got well, to, that's basically where all the good guys go to hang out isn't it oh gold school yeah and they sort of like don't they, they rewrite the constitution there or something yeah. Like. yeah so it's like the minute is safe haven yeah, <laughs> yeah. my first in, my first impulse would be to say that God's got God's gold <laughs> God's gold <laughs> is the the kind of the inner prison where you're mm. where the exiles are exiled to yeah. Oh, that's like, an interesting... That's a fascinating yeah. interpretation. Because, like, they're all there, and they're supposed to be self-attacking for being you know, the great people that they are, the, the capitalists that they are. Um, oh, yeah, and it's like they run away as a form of protection. Exactly. So, yeah, in a exactly. sense, she turns America, sort of the world society in general, into, like, massive Miko system. Yeah, yeah. If you're they're rare, so they're being protected in a safe place. Right. They erect the force field, yeah. don't they? And, um, it's because if I remember it rightly, it's shooting. John Galt who is like poaching all these good people, yeah. right? He sort of goes he's around yeah, poaching you know, them, yeah, and he's whispering yeah, sweet yeah, things into their ear, like yeah. you know, taking them out of society, yeah. And so he is like a manager in that context because mm. he's like protecting them almost. You mean in the internal family system yeah. context, yeah. This is, I don't know if you've heard of that book, but this is a psychology book called Internal Family Systems. Oh, yeah. And it's a way of, like, describing different parts of your personality. Like, the, the guy, the, the psychologist who wrote it has got ideas about them having different roles. So what Tom was saying about exiles are those parts of your 
self, the vulnerable parts that, that had to sort of escape in a way. Yeah, um, feel very intense feelings or very intense feelings of hurt or neglect or abandonment. Mm. And then you've got managers. Yeah. Which are like constantly working to keep those feelings at bay. So like um, people who engage in workaholism um, and, you know, distract themselves by sitting in front of like X amount of TV per day and stuff like that. That is like their managers in control mm. that's compelling them to do that. So they don't, so these feelings don't come up. Um, and Although then, those might be firefighting things to be. Well, the firefight, no, because the firefighting depends, thing is only after it's come up. Right? Yeah, right. If it's if you if you do it habitually and you're always say at, what do you say at a computer, or what did you say you're watching loads of TV? Yeah, 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 yeah like, like that's like a manager would manage you would preempt the escape of your exiles. And then, it's basically your exile uh, exiled parts of your this, this sort of multiplicity of your mind. Uh, the the feelings are so overwhelming that they can't be let out of the inner prison, as it were. So, so it keeps the sort of those yeah, exactly. keep them suppressed, and and then it's repressed, a, it's if a, not even completely forgotten. And then there's firefighters, the third group, which basically they don't manage; they just react to basically when exiles are released, they do they activate and they escape. Uh, the firefighters come along and extinguish the fire. So they, they're, like, responsible for things like alcoholism, or mm, binge drinking, mm. self-harm, suicide, yeah. suicide, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, my God, emergency, do something. Mm. We must make ourselves feel better. Like, yeah. you know. mm-hmm. yeah. But to treat Atlas Shrugged as, you know, a dream of Ayn Rand about our own personality right. and to think, <laughs> like, these are all inventions of our own yeah. mind, what did they mean for her personality is a fascinating idea. It's, yeah. I mean, and that's to treat them as exiles, I think, is a very interesting idea. Yeah. I did notice that one of the things in, Iron, in this book that struck me was there's a, there is a lot of real anger and hate that comes mm. through in the book. And you can tell how deeply hurt she is by mm. the moral condemnation of the people around her. Mm. And it comes through in the fact that even the heroes, they've got this seething anger underneath them mm. that is ready to break out into violence. Like, you know, there's a bit when... Frisco refrains from punching... Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, they... Reardon, um, it, I think. Yeah, they, they, he's talking to Reardon and they, they, there's something about, you know, he was happy he left because he was going to punch him in the face or something. Yeah. And, and yeah. you're kind of thinking... Easy, fellas. Yeah. You know, I thought you guys were yeah. libertarians, you know? She's describing the immense mental capacity it takes for him to hold back from mm. punching him, basically. I mean, her character does sound quite angry, just from her physical descriptions. Because mm. the way she talks about them being so angular and, you know, um, all their physical movements are very, like, controlled and yeah. hiding what they're actually mm. feeling. Like, it sounds like managers. Description that, it's a frequent description that she has. It's like... You know, Daphne's movements are very controlled. They did not let on her emotions. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. like, real... And that's the thing about Rand is that she is very I kind of repressed in a way. Yeah, like I think that, that's held up to be a virtue. That, that, that yeah. Repressing your feelings is, is yeah. held up to be a virtue, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And she talks about emotions a lot and recognises their power, but it's very much like a... Uh, she, she wants to control them and master them and bend them yeah. to the, to the mind's will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you see that like expressing itself in the way that the um, it kind of you know, Reardon works his metal, and that Candia kind of works his in copper mines and stuff. It's almost like a way of managing their internal yeah. space. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Yeah, because often she says like like when Dagny's talking to herself, Dagny's actually saying like, "Oh, don't think about it. I'll oh, stop it. I'll get on with it." You know, that's the messages mm. that Dagny's sort of telling herself. Mm. And so, like Rand's approach is basically just like bottle it up and carry on you know and mm-hmm. and i was just saying before like you can tell how hurt she is by the moral condemnation of the people around her and that comes out in this rage that you see in the characters but it also i thought it was interesting that when the in the tunnel collapse when the train uh, no not collapse yeah the tra- train crash in the tunnel you know, um, when there's the, basically there's this great sequence of showing how corruption leads to them sending this train through the tunnel with a smoke engine rather with a coal engine, mm-hmm. and yeah. and there was this bit that she describes the people on that train, 
And it's an interesting choice because she could have dramatically, she could have chosen to say, you know, all these innocent people got killed. But she actually goes through and describes like how corrupt everyone on that train is one by one. Mm. And even like she says, even there's at one point where she says, and a mother is tucking in her children, and you kind of think, well, okay, so this is going to be, you know, the one innocent character. And then she says, but she's a wife of a politician who's only got the money from stealing. And, and you know, and I actually thought that was an interesting choice and like a kind of a brave choice in a way because she's saying, you know, you think these people are innocent? Actually, they're all part of the system mm. and they're all corrupt. But I also also thought it was interesting because she sends them in her mind's eye. She's like sending these people off to be killed in a tunnel as part of this story, and she's almost like saying, "You know, fuck you. You're gonna you know, you you're corrupt anyway. I don't care. You know what I mean? There's like there's a certain amount of rage in in her in her choice of that of like that description in the novel that she kind of like you can tell how hurt she is and how how much disgust she feels at the the fact that there's so much buy-in by the general populace to all of this status nonsense. Mm. And she's almost saying, like, well, if you buy into it, then, you know, off you go to die in your tunnel because I'm not going to save you type of thing in my novel. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. I yeah, thought that was interesting. Really really hey, yeah. Hi. Hey, I thought that it was very interesting how there was a big lack of empathy for anybody who was on that train, even though they did bring it upon themselves in, in the ways that she described there's a very sort of cold and callous type of examination of them. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. She's she's sort of deliberately deliberately not choosing to make you feel bad for the innocent people who are killed. And because obviously like there's a couple on there who are directly related to the accident, like the politician. Mm. But there are a whole load of people who however corrupt they might have been in other parts of their life. It's not their fault that the train's going in the tunnel. They're not involved in that decision, but she's quite clear that she wants you to feel these guys deserve it. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree with that. Um, what, what were your favourite characters in the book, everyone, and, and why? That's an interesting question. You, you had one, didn't you? I like Francisco. Why do you like him? I mean, I agree with you. I think he's the nicest character, but what is it you like about him? I think because he seems like the most conscious character out of all of them. Because they've all got this weird, like, repression stuff going on. They're all sort of, like, fighting. Well, you know, all the good characters, anyway. Like, obviously, I'm not going to say, like, you know, Jim Taggart's my favourite character <laughs> or anything like that. But all the good characters who are potential sort of favourite character... Heroes. ...choices. Um, I think he's my favourite one because he he does what he does very deliberately. Like, he, seems, he always seems like he's aware mm. of why he's saying certain things, doing mm. certain things... And also, he's, like, the only character that she actually allows to express emotion. Like, there's a couple of times in front of mm. Dagny where he's like, no, I can't do it. And, you yeah, know, that's like, true. he sort of lets mm. emotion come out. And you don't really see that. I mean, she talks a lot with the other characters about how hard they're working to repress their emotions. But um, it's only really with Francisco that she sort of lets that barrier down. Mm. Yeah, it's like he's the only character that's not, uh, got any real humanity to it, really. The yeah, heroic yeah. characters, you know what I mean? Any real, um, sort of... I don't know. Seems like he's the only character that has anything behind him other than his work, do you know what I mean? I, I um, very much agree with um, uh, Danconia as one of the best uh, characters, one of my favourite characters in the book. Um, I also really liked, I can't remember the, the, guy, the guy's name, the, the boy's name, um, but he works for Hank Reardon and a hand calls him absolute and he um the, yeah. the, the, the wet nurse uh, no he works in the um steel factory of man hand written um just oh. doing like some basic okay stuff. not not the political guy who's sent yeah. in who i think he's called the, the no, wet nurse not the school guy he just comes from like the uh, university or something and he gets a job somehow but he actually changes his mind about about the nature of seeing his absolutes um, yeah, that, that is a character. That's absolute that's statement, right. and like he actually angered and becomes kind of like a father figure to the, yeah. the kid, and, yeah. and he gets uh, well, 
I don't think Tony Pottis is right, but he has an it's interesting character development, I think, and is someone that I can. I, I, there's a lot of emotion, I think, wrapped up in that story. That was that was quite powerful. Right. The relationship between those two yeah. characters. Yeah, I was racking my brains for the same guy, but. Yeah, he's a, he's a. I thought that was a great character, and that showed that Ayn Rand's more, you know, like conscientious and emotional side, perhaps. Yeah. Definitely, I definitely agree with that. And also gave a chance for the, um, the for somebody to change their mind, right? For like to get rid of that deterministic thread, if there was one. Mm. Someone, someone came around to the, the, the good side of good. Mm. Right. Yeah, that is true. That was something that I found kind of irritating all the way through the book. That there was never at any point, I mean, other than that one character, there's never a point in any point where a good person become, does anything bad or a bad person does anything good, you know what I mean? <laughs> just like you're set in your, um, your philosophical position and you're just kind of set on your way type of thing. Right, right. It's a very objectivist it's... thing, the, the objective bots kind of... Um, <laughs> yeah, the, they, position on there's the not... That, that's the thing, is that, I mean, I suppose the one thing that does happen in this book, like, because I mean, that is a criticism of Ayn Rand in general, is that people are kind of like, you know, somehow forged from steel in the womb and then they just appear as these... Uh, Nietzschean uh, heroes yeah. mm-hmm. and everyone else is kind of like, you know, basically a crappy, corrupt, weak person. Yeah. But, and so you don't get, you don't really get to see, like, how come Dagny has got what it takes yeah. and Hank has got what it takes and how come Dagny's brother is such a complete ass, you know? Yeah. And so you don't really get that. But, because she doesn't do the character arc. Like, why? You know, they're brother and sister. So, you know, there's got to be an interesting story there. Oh, yeah, oh like is... You talk about um, uh, Dagny and Jim as well. Yeah. yeah. Dagny and Jim Taggart. Like, uh, how they had supposedly a very, very similar childhood. Like, yeah. it seems like he was present yeah. and he would see uh, Francisco and yeah. that kind yeah. of, like, and, and Dagny's relationship and stuff and had access to the same resources and education yeah. and so on. And yet, mm. he's, like, staggeringly corrupt and... Yeah, and, and she's, and like, this great... Like, so amazingly productive. Yeah, yeah and I'm, I haven't finished the book yet, but she doesn't... Presumably, she doesn't really explain why she went one way and he went the other. Because, for I think, for Rand, part of this problem that she had is that I, I guess she just decided that she was bloody great and that she didn't maybe understand mm. her own character development to understand mm. how she managed to get to where she was at. And so the conclusion that she draws is basically either you've got it or you haven't, I think... Yeah, well, that is, I mean, because her whole, that whole sort of superiority complex she had was very unexamined, mm. as far as I'm aware. Like, I don't know much about what happened with her, but um, from what I've heard, it seems like, you know, she kind of basically thought that she was uber philosopher. Well, she thought she was the most moral person, and therefore yeah, everyone should love her the else, most. She and was superior to everyone else, basically. Yeah, kind of which is unfo- she unfortunate that she... But it doesn't seem like she really question that no uh, i don't think there was self-knowledge behind it i think yeah and the diff- it's difficult because she was pretty damn good yeah in so many ways um she was an incredibly impressive person yeah so that's got to be it's difficult because you know you, you can't you can lack self-knowledge quite easily if you're surrounded by people who just can't even keep up with you intellectually because she was just so smart but um and she, she despises weakness, and I think that comes across in her mm-hmm. grandiosity. Yeah. She doesn't like that vulnerability and, and the weakness she's very much with the kind of um, showing Jim Jim Taggart's corruption as a kind of weediness and loveliness, yeah. and mm-hmm. Dagny is very physically as well as intellectually superior. But I was going to say the one thing that she does have as an arc in the book is their coming to understand about morality and about the sanction of the victim like in the beginning Reardon for example is although he's you know he's kind of pissed off that he has to go to these parties and everything but he goes along with it and he also thinks that you know his wife's basically you know a good person and he feels a bit guilty about the fact that he doesn't really love her and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and at the end of it you know although I haven't got to the end of the book but as it as it progresses you can see him coming to realize this point about like uh, that that um, Francisco and everyone's making to well, the, the Francisco and the, the John Galt dudes are making to him about why do you allow these you know these moral contradictions between the way that you live your private life and your personal life and the way that you interact with steel and with the physical world and that's great because that is actually like a 
it's an intellectual development, but it's not really a character development in the sense that he's already basically a moral guy. He just doesn't understand that yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's true because the thing is that it, at every point in the book, he's always doing what he thinks is right. It's just that what he thinks is right changes. Uh, and I think the thing that is lacking in the book is that there's no point where any good person does a bad thing or any bad person does a good thing. Do you know what I mean? The bad characters are just bad and they always do bad things and they never, you know, like, you know, if it, if it had been a bit where towards the end of the book where everything's collapsing, there had been a few of the bad people who saw the error of their ways, then at least it might be a little bit more sort of, you know what I mean, kind of realistic. Whereas it was the kind of the, the whole thing was the basis of, you know, Dagny and Francisco and Reed and they're all good because of their innate ability. And, and that's why they're good and uh, Jim isn't, because he doesn't have that same innate ability that they have, even though he was born in the same conditions. Yeah. But I mean, it's not really very satisfying as an explanation, really. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think that's also why I like the character Absolute, whatever his yeah. real name is, real character name, because he's seen as someone who kind of comes from a corrupt society who learns through Reardon, and changes his mind about a lot of things and also has profound emotional as well as intellectual shift. And that, that, that sort of provided a bridge for me between the, the iconic characters and the, the kind of the corrupt and mutual characters. It was, uh, it was quite satisfying for me. But um, I think it's also you know, lacking in other areas of the book. Somehow. Although, you know, I'm just thinking about it. In fact, there is also a character, like he's a character who goes effectively from bad to good. And there is a character who goes from good to bad because there's the two, there's the philosopher and the scientist mm. who teach the three yes. top dudes, right? And the scientist guy starts off as being, you know, a rationalist and so forth. And he basically gets corrupted by state money and um, by his, his, you know, all of the, you know, comforts of having his labs and, and so on and so forth. And by the time yeah. um, Dagny catches up with him, he's, he's like, totally stuck totally in that way. Yeah. Dr. Stadler, isn't it? Yes, exactly, yeah. Dr. Stadler. It's like a kind of origin story for the way that mm. the society is because you've got the good guy who's sort of disappeared, basically, and is working behind the scenes. And they're kind of like, you know, twins. Right. They've taught the same course, and one's gone good, one's gone bad. Yeah, and you're right. It's a very, you know, like, sort of old-style myth, you know? Yeah, it's like, you know, God and Satan kind of thing, yeah. basically. Yeah. But I, I think the thing about Dr. Sattler is that, it, it, from the very start, when we first see him and we hear all the explanations about him, it's the, the fact is that he's unconcerned with morality. Mm. Um, yeah. the, which is why he, he's only about the practical and getting his getting his grant money. He doesn't care about how it's how he gets it as long as he gets it type of thing. And so that's where. So I don't think he, at any point he was really good. Right. I see what you're you know saying. What I mean? Yeah. He was just a useful um, for them. He was a useful, like rational, science oriented, logic and reason type of guy. But because he was devoid of any interest in morality, he just floats off into corruption. Whereas, yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas the, um, the three university friends then go off and follow H Hugh um, Axton and actually have morality and go off and sort of do their thing. I was going to say, yeah. I, do, I did like the... I love the idea... And the, the, like, I've only, uh, I'm not sure if he shows up more, but um, Ragnar Daniskul oh, yeah. is a great fun yeah. character. In oh, this. yeah, I love him. I mean, that's just such a great idea to Robin have. He's like right. the anti-Robin Hood. The anti-Robin Hood. I mean, yeah. what a yeah. fun... Yeah. The rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's so, he's so cool in the way that he describes that as well, because yeah. he actually says that too. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I just thought, Ah, this is like this has got real guts to have an anti Robin Hood in this in this thing, and for him to be a pirate. Mm, yeah. It was just a damn shame that because she was a minicist, like yeah. she said, that she has him say a couple of really silly lines, like, "Well, of course, I would never actually uh, attack a naval ship because they have a legitimate function in society." It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, iron, yeah, Iron Rand, please. But 
in general, the idea of a guy who is so morally outraged by the state that he's like, fuck you, I'll actually come and, I'll come and sink your ships and steal from you because yeah. you're mm. a bunch of thieves. Yeah. That's awesome, you know? He's a total yeah. badass. <laughs> but I, I, I think the thing about it is that, uh, I think, I can't remember if they addressed it in the book, but the fact is that the original Robin Hood stories is Robin Hood steals from the tax collector and gives to the people that he's taken the money from. Oh, and so, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But then it's been twisted around and, and it's... Uh, and it's now everybody thinks of it as him stealing from the rich to give to the poor in a kind of socialist way. Yeah. Whereas the reality of the story is that it's more of a kind of anarchist way. It's the, you know, take from the people who are stealing type of thing. Absolutely. And, and, um, and I was just listening to, because I'm still listening to the book at the moment, and actually Ragnar says that in his speech. Ragnar does, does say, you know, originally the story was about... Um, uh, taking back taxes, um, but the way the story has become to be known of Robin Hood, mm. he's yeah, become like this... He's used as a piece of propaganda. Yeah, he's, he's used as a piece of yeah. socialist propaganda, and Ragnar says, that's the guy who I'm against, like that sort of mythical story that's come to be known. And uh, I thought his, mm. his um, Ragnar is just a brilliant and, like, uh, I mean, obviously a very, very, like, uh, larger-than-life Mm. idea but his really Ayn Rand's sense of justice yeah, like, yeah. He's taking notes on people like he, yeah. he knows he's yeah. working out how much they had in their bank before yeah you know, and he's giving like them that. back their income tax yeah. that's yeah. so cool that's yeah. just so funny yeah. <laughs> that's but, like uh, the ultimate fantasy someone's going to come and say you know what here's all your income tax back <laughs> and, and of course ironically of the three I think it's John Gould who is the least interesting Really? Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. other than his uh, thing at the 20th Century Motor Company, where he walks out and says he's and shouts he's going to stop the motor of the world. Outside of that, he hasn't really got a whole lot interesting going on, you know, personality-wise. He's just kind of like a sort of uh, an objectivist automaton, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's just Mr. Chiseled, basically, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Francisco and uh, Ragnar are far more interesting, and yet. Yeah. Uh, considered to be the, you know, lesser brothers, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. but they, they're the ones who've actually got a lot of richness of character and backstory and depth. And Galt is just this, you know, sculpture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, how she split the characters in, um, I don't know, ways that I don't think were well explained, such as um, how Dagny and Jim became so different. Yeah. Um, again, like, in, one thing that was interesting about the God's Gulch was um, the children. That, that was one of the few scenes where it was really explored how children might be raised, um, mm-hmm. because God's Gulch is kind of like the, the really free, uh, idealistic, utopian kind of, you know, Randian idea of free society or whatever. And, and that's the only thing I, that I can think of which shows... Uh, sort of parent-child interaction. The only one I can think of was something very briefly where um, the parents of Dagny, um, like the, the, uh, Dagny runs off with uh, Francisco when they're very young, and when someone else, uh, the person that ends up working for Dagny, I can't remember his name. Eddie Willis. Eddie Willis. Thank you, yeah. And they end up like in some factory, because the you know, those crazy kids are always breaking into factories and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, building crazy stuff or whatever they're doing. Um, and, and but of get, course you do. And then their parents get phoned up and I think yeah. the, the mother comes and she kind of gives them kind of a, a light, very light scolding or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only other time I can think of that there's that kind of parent-child interaction is in Gold School. Which well, is of course, but what about of... Reardon? I mean, there's a whole, there's a, an awful lot of mother-child interact. Obviously, mm-hmm. he's an adult by yeah, then, but you true. see... Like this poisonous relationship. Well, they're the moochers um, in the family. Yeah, of they're mooching off. They're like the microcosm of the, the society. That Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the moochers of the spirit, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. But uh, I, I think regarding the uh, the two children that in Galt's Galt, I mean, I don't know. It never really seemed like it kind of seemed like she was trying to make a point, but it never seemed really. To, to come through for me, it kind of it felt a bit like you know when 
if you've ever read any neat stories talking all about the the Superman, it's I kind of like I picture these children as like the child Superman of Nietzsche type of thing. You know what I mean? It's kind of just sort of these bold, striding young men, you know, type of thing. And it's I don't know, it just it never struck me as anything that felt like it could be uh, Yeah, it's a bit like an afterthought kind of, to me. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, and also, you know, in this great place, the the kids are really happy, kind of thing. Yeah, look, look at yeah. them, the wind flowing through their hair as they play on the. Uh, you know, the well, she doesn't really know how to write family stuff, does she? I mean, mm. she's got the adult relationships where there's like this, you know, bitchy mum mm-hmm. with Reardon, but there are no kids. None of the lead characters have got kids, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody. She never has. Her heroes have never got families. Yeah, don't she the, doesn't the settle down time. No. Really. And of course, she didn't have kids. So she doesn't know how to write it. Because yeah. Rand yeah. didn't have any kids. Right. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure why Rand didn't have any kids. Is it? Do you know if she was not able to, or did she just choose not to? No idea. It's a good question. I've never actually. Be interesting to know, because mm-hmm. that definitely is an in, uh, influence on. I mean, she smoked yeah. a hell of a lot, so <laughs> maybe she just didn't want to give up. <laughs> Although I know she probably wouldn't have anyway. Yeah, that's probably true. But uh, I, I think the other interesting thing is that, you know, all throughout the books, there's, uh, you know, there's people having except left, right and centre. But there's never any even consideration of children. There's never, like, oh, you know, like, yeah. like you know what I mean, like, you got true. Hank Weird and and Dagny Taggart kind of in it every which way but Sunday. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah, there's no discussion about whether or not he used a condom. Yeah, or or you know, is this or, or even not even if you're just talking about kids, but even like a relationship as in like not just like a boyfriend girlfriend relationship, but you know like a proper relationship, like you know. Like, having a family it just never even occurs to any of the characters. Well, I think that's an interesting up. point, because it kind of seems like for a lot of people who end up getting together in her books, like, there is a lot of sex, but not very much relationship going on. Like, their relationship is mostly yeah. based on business, rather than... Yeah, like Dagny and... and uh, yeah, well, Dagny and Hank is a prime example of that. Yeah, basically, they've done good business together, and then they do some good shagging together. And that's basically the relationship. And even with, like, Dagny and Francisco in the beginning, it's like, you know, they don't actually have, like, a relationship. It's just sort of like, you know, mm. they get on every now and again. Yeah, and they admire each other's, you know, business, intellect, intellect and, and business yeah, prowess. Yeah, capability. Yeah. And what's also, I was thinking about this, like, as reading the books, like, so, Francisco, let me get this straight, mate. You've decided for 10 years to basically <laughs> lie to the only woman that you've ever loved because you reckon that she's not ready to hear it and she'll be ready at some point, like, in the indefinite future. And then you're going to try and get back together. with Like, what kind of a fucking plan is that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Why not just sit her down right at the beginning and tell her what's happening? Yeah. And say, come with me. Yeah. <laughs> Why not have a like chat that? with, you know, the love of your life? Like, listen, I've had this really important conversation with this guy called John Galt, and I'm, you know, it's a really big <laughs> yeah, issue yeah. for me. I'd like to talk it through yeah. with you. <laughs> and also, like, I found that she really overemphasized or exaggerated the character's um, um, something like emotional attachment or dependency on the the system that they were still working in, and so like. Like somehow, like D- Dagny wasn't ready for Gould's school. She wasn't ready. He wasn't, she wasn't ready for the whole truth, and that mm-hmm. um, you know she was still clung to her railroad, and she was still like fighting against the kind of the spirit of John Gould, or whatever. Run, you know, the shockwaves running through society. And there was this whole like battle going on, and I just thought that's crazy. Like her, her life is a freaking nightmare of bureaucracy, <laughs> yeah. and unionized um, shakedowns I, I, and stuff. It's like, I just feel like, fuck the railroad. I'm kind of chill out in the... Go to the cost, go. <laughs> I, I do wonder if that was more just a device to make, to draw the book out a bit longer. Cause it doesn't kind of fit really. Does it? You are, you are exactly right. I mean, these people were ready for the conversation much earlier on, but it would have made yeah, for a much same. shorter book. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But I also I also think it's the old Matrix thing where anybody who isn't who's still plugged into the system could be an agent type of thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they're not ready to let go. 
Right, right. Mm. But yeah, they've got some very, very bizarro relationship ideas like that. You know, let's just not talk about something for 10 years. Yeah. It's the most important thing in my life. Uh, yeah, and it's like sort of, you know, she will wait. Yeah. yeah. And then surprise, surprise, she shacks up with another guy. Well, what did he bloody expect? It was 10 years. Yeah. And he's been going off and being a and he's been, playboy. Yeah, and he's, been, yeah. and he's been pretending to sleep with every woman in town. So, yeah, in the 10 years, she might have gotten over you. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's completely fine about it for some reason. Like, he's been finding after this woman for, like, the last decade. And she suddenly goes, oh, well, and he finds out that she's going out with Reardon. But he's totally fine with it because Reardon is a man of honour. And then after <laughs> Reardon, it's Galt. And it's like, okay, now she's with Galt and that's going to be it for the rest of the book. How pissed off would you be if you were Francisco Danconia? Can you imagine? Like, but there's nothing about that at all. You know, there's no, like... But I, I think that is also to do with the whole thing she had going with, you know... Uh, Nathaniel Brandon and the whole kind of, you know, that whole thing going on. It, there was this kind of thing, oh, well, you know, you can swap lovers and it doesn't hurt anybody type of thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that the originator of the railroad was called Nathaniel Taggart. Yeah. Nat Taggart. Oh. Nat Taggart. I was thinking, oh, yeah, you would use that name, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but also, yeah, the, the relationship between Reardon and Dagny, like, I mean, where's the... They just sort of start sleeping together. And that's really it, you know. It's like, hang on a minute. Yeah, and, and he's, the... he's married. And then, you know, yeah. now she's got a, he, like, he's got a key to her house. And he basically shows up for a shag when he feels like it. Mm. And, it's... and then goes back to his wife. <laughs> and it's basically the trade is like... For him, it's like, you know, the first time when I saw you, I knew that I wanted to degrade you. It's like, that's not very romantic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. Sure. Sounds great. <laughs> What's yeah. an excellent basis for a romantic relationship? Yeah. <laughs> what a womanizer. Women are a lot like steel pipes. Yeah. <laughs> are they? I just find women like a cheap steel. <laughs> <laughs> what <Well, I'm> up? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and this is like the, for this evening. I'll ask Chris and Rand because obviously I, I think as most people here would agree, like she's absolutely brilliant. Uh, uh, genius, but I did kind of think the gold sculpt thing was a little bit like the Bi- Bible or the Old Testament um, Noah's Ark thing. Yeah, because it was like, like the animals come two <laughs> two by two. And it was like, hang on, right? So like <laughs> some guys are going around poaching like the best of best in society, and you've got like. I, know, I didn't see any, like, you know, virtuoso hairdressers. <laughs> there was so much missing from Gold yeah. School. There was kind of like, just, hang on, okay, so you've got coffee, you've got this, you've got this, got that. What about, you know, the ice cream stall? And, yeah. <laughs> 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 like, cool. yeah, yeah. So where's all this stuff coming from? It's like, that's true. On, yeah. What about all the people that just said, nah, fuck them, they can all die with the rest of us, yeah, or whatever. It's like, come on, there's, there's some really, okay, then uh, maybe 98% of the level that you need to get into gold's gold, you know, come on, like, yeah, let, let them in, they could, you're right, good shoes, fact, you know, they, like, they, they had to fly back to the, the real world occasionally, didn't they, for supplies and stuff, I guess, mm. so, yeah. Yeah, there was definitely and stuff. Also, also, could you imagine if on the outside world you're like, you know, you're one of the cleverest people at your companies, but you go to Galt's Gulch and you're actually the stupidest guy there and you have to clean out the toilets or something because there's no other <laughs> job for it. <laughs> that must be kind of irritating, right? Well, you can imagine the edited scene from her book because there is that scene when, when what is it, um, Gold gets Dagny to do like the, the house cleaning or is she it in cooks. reverse or she cooks? She and cooks. He has this kind <laughs> yeah. of slightly. Um, bigoted pride in that, like yeah. like domination over her or yeah. something. It's like, mm-hmm. that weird relationship they have. And I always can imagine this deleted scene with you know, like one of the characters taking great pride in being allowed into the good school because he gets like the toilet cleaning job or something. <laughs> <laughs> taking such pride in, in scrubbing the bowl and so on. I will be the most virtuous <laughs> bowl scrubber in history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because every penny I earn scrubbing bowls isn't taken away from me by the legal tax collector. <laughs> oh, dear. Someone say it's elitist. <laughs> Just, you know, a little bit. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank Make you, Jake. Great chat. Cheers. 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 Bye.